we crown you with praise. Let's go to church as this choir begins to sing.
Oh uh-huh. 
want to say, boy, didn't those men look good on that back row. We had a full row of them. But those women looked good too, didn't they? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, welcome to Revival Meeting. Amen. That bird right over there will be doing the preaching here in a little bit. <laughs> Brother Danny, we love you and we're glad you're here with us. And, and we just want to let go... I, I thought, you know, sometimes it's easy to get uh, to let go and, and have a good time when, when you got singers, but, uh, but we're going to have some preaching after a while. We ought to let go and, and, and just shout the house down because we know that we're going to hear the Word of God. Praise the Lord. We're going to go to the, the Lord in prayer. Do you have requests tonight before we pray? Remember this. And uh, the lady across the street had people hurt and stopped uh, the dementia. So she wanted to go to the Amen. Remember this. Yes. Anyone else? Amen. Anyone else? Oh, Trina. Bless his heart. Pastor, I'm a visitor. See me. I go down the street. Up, but I've been up there several times and you got the whole revival. Mm -hmm. We have so many people that are so sick in our church with cancer, sugar, diabetes, heart disease, and I go on and on. I say there's about 20 families. Are out right now with these uh, terrible diseases. So pray for our church out there and these people. Amen. Amen. We need to pray for all the churches in in the community. The Lord will just give them the help that's needed. I'm sure everybody has somebody tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. John Thompson, lead us to the throne of grace. Lord, we're so glad that, that we can come uh, as we are and we know the Heavenly Father. Oh, you told us, Heavenly Father, that we're two or three. We're gathered in your name. We thank God there you will be in our midst. We pray, Holy Spirit, we'll be found out to walk the aisles, the avenues of our heart. We've come together to worship you. Heavenly Father, you say, they that worship you must worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray that the Holy Spirit, Lord God, will have his praises right away. Let us let go tonight. And allow the Spirit of the living God to saturate our soul and fill us, O oh God, till our cup runneth over, Heavenly Father, that we can be a blessing, Lord, to someone along the way. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for another opportunity for revival meeting. And we pray, Heavenly Father, from this very at uh, uh, the night, Heavenly Father, may we uh, uh, see our results and uh, see uh, people receive help. We know that, Heavenly Father, this for the church is strengthened that, Heavenly Father, that, Lord God, we can go on and, and see our uh, Lord God Almighty move and see souls one for the kingdom of God. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for Brother Danny, that you give him that option, that anointing of God's Holy Spirit, and help him, Heavenly Father, to have to be able, Lord God, to have that glorious freedom to preach the word. Amen. We give you praise. And we pray, Holy Spirit, remember, our Lord God, the church there at Hampton, our Serena, Heavenly Father, and every church around us, Heavenly Father, and the needs of Lord God, your help. We pray, precious Jesus, tonight, that the Lord God bless the singing, bless the testimonies, bless the shouts of praise, and we call for the many, Lord God, that are sick and afflicted, and we know, Lord God, you're still the great healer, we ask you, Heavenly Father, tonight to have your gracious right away, and we'll give you the I'll make some announcements, and then I'll get out of the way. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't even have to announce that, that uh, we're having fall revival. It begins tonight, don't it? Uh, if you're reading the Bible through this year, uh, and you need the fourth quarter uh, lesson plan, it's out there in the vestibule, and you can pick it up there. Uh, 
we'll have rally day here on October 10th. And I think we said last uh, evening that uh, if a person has not been here in three months, they're a candidate and you can work on them and see if you can get them out to church. I, I, I made the statement and I, I said, I hate to say it like this, but if you can get some of those uh, members <laughs> that, that haven't, haven't been out in, in three months, uh, they'll, they'll be a good, uh, a good uh, a candidate for, uh, for the rally day. And what's going to happen is you've got even and odd teams. If you're not on one of those teams and want to get on and see Robin, and she'll allow you to draw a number there and you'll get on the team. And uh, the evens are going to be against the odds. Uh, uh, anybody that hadn't been here in three months on, on rally day that's here, in the service at the close of, uh, of uh, the Sunday school, uh, the count will be made. And the team that wins will be fed by the team that loses. The church is going to supply the, the hot dogs and the hamburgers. And, and I guess uh, the losing team will have to make the, the potato salad and whatever else we have. But we'll have a good time. It, it's all in fun. I, I don't, don't anybody uh, uh, think that, you know, you have to, to kind of get mad at, at, at situations. Just come out and, and, and enjoy inviting people to church. And I, I know we'll have a, have a good time. Uh, ladies Auxiliary, uh, they'll be meeting, where did I see that at? Well, next Monday night, late, here it is, Ladies Auxiliary will be meeting next Monday night, 7 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall, and I'm assuming there'll be a board meeting that night also. So, those are the requests for the evening hour. Uh, we'll not take up an offering uh, this week. Uh, on Friday evening, there, if you, you're not going to be here uh, Friday, there's a box in the back that you can put your, uh, your offering in. But on Friday evening, we'll take up a free will offering for Brother Danny at every, every cent that, that comes in uh, uh, will we'll go to him. Uh, okay, I guess we're ready now. Mike, who's going to sing for us tonight? Okay. Who you want first? <laughs> for once, I think I got him that time. For, for, one, for once, he didn't have words. <laughs> tell you a story it's one I love to tell from the Bible Paul and Silas thrown in jail even in that prison they knew someone was there so they never gave up no they never gave up on God they said we'll just start to praise him and when we do it once, we'll do it again. And we'll keep on praise until the shackles fall off. Keep on praise until the shackles fall off. Praise Him in the midnight hour. Praise Him for His mighty power. Praise Him when your heart is broken. Praise Him till the prison doors open. Just when you think, just when you think you've worshipped Him enough. Keep on praise until the shackles fall off. Keep on praise until the shackles fall off. Now when your life seems hopeless and everything goes wrong, 
And you're locked up in a prison of your road There's a light at the end of the tunnel No matter what you're going through So don't ever give up, no, never give up on God Just begin to praise Him and when you do it once, you'll do it again And keep on praise until the shackles fall off Keep on praise until the shackles fall off Praise Him in the midnight hour Praise Him for His mighty power Praise Him till your heart is broken Praise Him till the prison doors open Just when you think, just when you think you've worshipped Him enough Keep on praise until the shackles fall off. Keep on praise until the shackles fall off. Praise Him in the midnight hour. Praise Him for His mighty power. Praise Him when your heart is broken. Praise Him till the prison doors open. Just when you think, just when you think you've worshipped Him enough. Keep on praise until the shackles fall off. Keep on praise until the shackles fall off. Keep on praise until the shackles fall off. The trial that you face seems so unfair. You wonder if the thought doesn't really care. You're tired of all the pain and all your tears. You just need some relief from the burdens and your fears and every trial every battle every wound every scar god knows just where you are and he has promised he'll never leave you Lord, today he already made a way so you're weary from the fight and from the war and you think you just can't go on anymore though helplessness surrounds you my don't you give up and quit trying on him you can depend in every trial every battle every wound every scar god knows just where you are and he has promised he'll never already made a way so keep trusting in the God who never fails he is faithful to deliver his power still prevails and every trial every Scar, God knows just where 
you are and he has promised he'll never leave you long before this valley came today he already made a way long before your valley came today he already She'd ever fix. Then along came Elijah saying, Don't be afraid, just go and do what you hear the Lord say. You've seen your faith, surely He will make a way. So she poured on the oil out of the cruise and the last ounce of flour. From the barrel she scooped, made cake for the prophet, herself and her little son too. The flour from the barrel, it never ran short, and the oil from the cruise continued to pour beyond the bottom of her barrel. She reached into the top of the Lord, at the bottom of the barrel. Every need he shall supply When all that we have ends That's when all that he has begins There's nothing but a miracle At the bottom of the barrel there are times here in this life when everything's wrong and nothing seems right. We walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. And when there are no cattle out in the stall and all of the grapes from the vine fall, remember God has promised that he will take care of it all. God will provide every need he shall supply when all that we have ends that's when all that he has begins there's nothing but a miracle at the bottom of the barrel when all that we have ends that's when all that he has begins there's nothing but a miracle at the bottom of the Everybody mind the Lord. Like I don't know if he's with us or he's not. He's with us. It's why our everyday 
Everybody mind the Lord. It's going to be a little bit different this week. Uh, uh, we'll probably not do as much singing, but we, uh, that'll give us more time for, for more preaching. And uh, <laughs> we're going to have a good time this week. Brother Danny, I think everybody knows him. If you, if you don't know him, uh, uh, Brother Danny Campbell's from down the Portsmouth Way or, or out toward Lucasville, I guess, isn't it, Danny? And uh, we're glad that he's here with us tonight. I've been looking at that sign, the 100 year homecoming. Boy, that seems like a long time, but probably if I could go back and, and put a date to it, it's probably been around 38 years, first time I came up here. And there's probably some of you folks been here 50 or 60 years. So 100 years, not too, uh, too awful long, we look at it that way, is it? Amen, been a lot of coming and going in that length of time. Appreciate the opportunity to come. Again, it was kind of under uh, bad conditions where a uh, preacher had some problems and not able to make it. But we're just glad that we were able to come tonight. If you have your Bible with you, turn to the 16th chapter of the book of Judges. While you're getting there, I'll get comfortable. -er. Now, I could have taken advantage of an hour and a half preaching years ago, but anymore, that's that's just, I could do it one night, then I wouldn't show up the rest of the week, maybe. <laughs> Things have changed in 38 or 9 years, but we sure appreciate the Lord tonight. 16th chapter of the book of Judges, we're going to bounce around just a little bit in that. In verse 9, this is all about Samson. Messing with a lady by the name of Delilah, and I, I would tell any young man if he comes across a girl by the name of Delilah, stay far away from her. <laughs> Not much good would come of that. Verse 9, now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. Now if you go down to verse 12. Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him therewith and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. Now I got to turn my page to get to the next one. But verse 14, she's, she's at it again and working on the hair. And she fastened it with the pen and she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And then down in verse 20, and she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with the fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. Amen. Lord, would you have a word of prayer with us tonight? God, just come and help us share what little bit's upon our heart. Father, in the name of the Lord, we just come tonight so thankful for the opportunity to be in the pulpit again. 
Lord, we never know in this day and time when it could be the last opportunity we have. And we want to be faithful to that. And I just pray tonight that, God, you would come and just give us physical strength as we need it, but also, God, that spiritual power that comes from on high. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost come and free us and bring liberty to our mind that we might be able to think the thoughts that you would have us to think. And, Lord, we'll praise you and we'll thank you for all you do this evening in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. and amen. We want you to look tonight and just give a little bit of thought. When you go through the Bible in the Old Testament, you would find out that quite a few times the, the Philistines are mentioned in that Old Testament. Apparently they're, they're supposed to be gone now, but they really aren't. But, but in the Old Testament, many, many times they showed up. And when you really look, and I looked up to find the first time I could find the mention, it was after Abraham had had his name changed from Abram to Abraham. And it said that at that time that, that Abraham walked through the, the or Abraham sojourned in the Philistines land many days. There was a change that took place in Abraham, but even though a great change had taken place in him, he was living and dwelling and sojourning through the land of the Philistines. Now, folks, when we get saved, we might say, well, everything's all right. I'm going to go to heaven, and everything's going to be different. Well, it will be different in you. You met, If you didn't get saved, I had a man stop the other day that I'd worked with uh, over 30 years ago. He'd gotten saved four years ago. And he said, you know, when I got saved, everything changed. And I said, well, if it didn't, you didn't get it. If you say you got saved and the sin didn't fall off and you're still involved in that, you need to get to an altar somewhere and do some more repenting and calling out to God. But when you get changed, God changes you and he starts on the inside and works his way out with the rest of it. But at the same time, just like Abraham of old, we're walking through the Philistine land. I'm here to tell you tonight, just like Samson found out, uh, those Philistines are a pesky bunch. Uh, they're doing uh, everything they possibly can uh, to bring you down, uh, to destroy your faith, uh, to turn you back to the place that you go back to the world. Uh, but thank God through the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, this night uh, we have been given victory over the Philistines uh, that come upon our life. Uh, I'm glad we don't have to be bound. Uh, I'm glad we don't have to be tied. But thank God we can and live a life of victory in the Lord while we're walking right through the land of the Philistines. You might say, I don't know about them Philistines. Well, I do. You walk out on that street and go up and down the streets and talk to folks tonight. Most of them are living in a Philistine home. If you go down to Washington, D.C., most of those down there are Philistines tonight uh, that don't want anything to do with God uh, or the things of God. They might make a ceremonial profession uh, of something about their type of religion, uh, but God really has never gotten a hold of their hearts. Uh, they're living in Philistine land uh, and acting like Philistines. Uh, and folks, when you and I get saved, uh, we might as well make up our mind uh, that there's going to be a pest uh, that's going to be running around. Uh, you see in the word of God, when God brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, uh, the Amalekites were continually making prey of them. Uh, God said, I'll have war with them from generation to generation. He was talking about the flesh. Uh, and there's always going to be that fight and warfare with the flesh. Uh, but the Philistines are a whole different branch uh, altogether. They're birth to the devil. Uh, amen. They're going to do everything the devil would have them to do uh, and attempt uh, to destroy God's people uh, and God's church. Uh, but I said it already. Thank God we've been given the victory through the cross, uh, through the resurrection. Uh, we have been given victory in Jesus tonight. Amen. I want to just share a few thoughts tonight. As, uh, well, since I don't have to be in a hurry, I'll take my time. What in the world are, are they to do? How do you recognize them? First of all, there are many a time that come up, they're just unsolicited thoughts. You'll find things flying into your mind. It doesn't make any difference how long you've been saved. 
there's going to be things come up in your mind. We never had a computer in our house until our son, uh, quite a few years back now, went to college and he had to have a computer. And uh, uh, so we put it in there where everybody would be able to see what was going on with it so nothing get out of hand. But you know, we found out very quickly that, that you, can, you could punch up something uh, that was wholesome and good, uh, or he could look up things about his schoolwork, uh, but every once in a while, there could be a pop-up that would come on it. Something you didn't want in your house, uh, something you didn't want your children or yourself looking at, uh, and that pop-up would just come up there. Uh, you'd never hit the wrong button. Uh, you'd never solicited that, but it came anyway. Uh, and folks, after you get saved... Uh, and you begin to walk with God and serve God, you'll find out no matter how long you've been saved that things will come popping up to that mind. Things that you don't want to think about. Things that you don't want to bring up. Things that you don't want end up to be involved with. But they'll come to that mind. And the devil is using those Philistines' thoughts to try to get your mind off the Lord, off the victory God gave you, and to try to turn you around uh, and get you to doing perhaps uh, the things that you did uh, before God ever saved you. They're unsolicited, but they come up. And they're a nuisance. They're a pest. Uh, amen. You know, I never solicited to get a mouse in the house. I never put out a sign. Mouse wanted. Need one to run through the house. Need one to get in the food. Need one to do this or that. But every once in a while, one of them boogers will get in there. He just kind of pops in in his own way. You say, how in the world could he ever get in? I don't know, but they do. And when they come, they come to just aggravate and to bring you to a place that you just want to give them a good kick. And folks, I tell you what we need to do with the devil when he sends the Philistines a pest in that mind. You need to just take him by the the back of the neck, amen, take him out to the woodshed, beat him with the cross, turn him loose, and say, I don't want nothing to do with your filth and garbage in my life. They're just thoughts that come up. They're people or situations who, uh, who provoke or threaten people that you have never done anything to. All of a sudden, the Philistine will be calling you on the phone. You know, probably... Eight or ten years ago, we getting ready for church. I was pastoring a little church in Pike County called Cotty's Corner and getting ready for church on a, uh, I think it was Tuesday night. We had the midweek and, and phone rang. And Debbie said, it must be for you. So I answered it. And when it got on there, there was some guy talking. Uh, and I said, who in the world are you? He never would tell me who he was. I, I, I said, uh, I think you've got the wrong number. He said, no, I, I've got the right number. He said, I know exactly who you are. He said, I'm going to come out there and clean your pipes. Well, I sounded like Jed Clampett talking to him. You know, I didn't know what he was talking about. I said, I ain't got no pipes. Hey, man, I, I, here I, I've got a gas furnace, and, and there's no pipes much to that. They don't need cleaned. Uh, and he kept getting more insistent uh, that he's going to give my pipes a good cleaning. Uh, and I finally said, well, if you want to clean them, you just come on out. Uh, hey, man, and we'll see what we can find you can work on. Uh, well, I got the church that night, told my son, uh, I I said, you know, uh, there's a guy called me. He's very insistent uh, that he's going to come out and clean my pipes. Uh, Josh started laughing. Uh, I said, what you laughing about? He said, you don't know what he's talking about? I said, ain't got a clue. Uh, he said, he's going to come out to your house and give you a whipping, Dad. Uh, he, he, he just, for some reason, mad at you, and he's going to come out and whip him. Well, got back home. As uh, soon as we walked in the door, that phone rang again. Uh, hey, man, same old boy on the end of it. Uh, I said, said, buddy, you got the wrong number here. No, I know you. I know right where you live. I'm coming to clean your pipes. I said, what's well, the best thing you can do? Get in the car and come right on. Hey, man, I'd had about all of him I was going to put up with. My wife said, I'm calling the sheriff. She called him. A deputy stopped. He said, now, if he comes, somebody comes out here, start something, you call us. I said, I'll call you, but it won't have to be in no hurry. I've got the old double barrel loaded with double 
what buck it's sitting right there by the door he gets out comes through that door starting something he won't be hard to find there'll be a piece here and a piece there I tell you the Philistines are always trying to provoke one way or another to get you to turn your thoughts from God Maybe you never had that, but we have sometimes 10, 15 of them Philistines call a day. Hey, man, they just aggravate and you scam you, try to get something out of you. And, and I really believe the devil will raise up people within our lives that we don't even really hardly know that will come against us in a way to try to, to bankrupt us spiritually. And folks, the pesciness of those Philistines just come around, come around, come around, and, and they just become things that are completely beyond our control. We're living in a land right now in America that's out of control. Amen. It's completely out of control. And, and, and we're just in a mess as Americans today. If you're a child of God and you want to do right, you're in the wrong. Everything that I was brought up to be taught that was right in the sight of God and right for this country, uh, the leaders of this nation now say it's wrong. Uh, and and uh, I never seen such a bunch of foolishness uh, trying to do away with the history of a nation uh, by taking down statues, uh, by changing the names of towns and schools. Uh, that is nothing, folks, uh, but just the peskiness of the Philistines uh, trying to destroy a nation that God God created to be his own and I don't know about you there's times but I feel like there's no control of it but I do know one that has control and I believe if God's people begin to call upon the name of the Lord with all of their heart and God will send a moving of his spirit across this nation that things can be changed and we can see this nation turn back to God with all of its heart hallelujah the Philistines want you to live in a place where there's no control. What do you do when they come against you and they just seem to, to be overwhelming numbers? You always look and you see in the, in the 15th chapter of Judges, oh, Samson, he, he's always picking around on the Philistines. He's kicking them around. He got mad at them because uh, they took his wife away from him and, and then they... They burned her, and, and, and it, he just got in a mess with them. So he began to swoop down upon them, raid their caravans, uh, and he would go to the top of the rocky tam and hide out up there. Now the sad thing about that story is that, that they, the Philistines came to 3,000 uh, of the elders of Israel. And they said, you know, we've got a problem with Samson, and he's an Israelite, and we're Philistines, uh, and we want you to do something about it. I know there was probably no more than a thousand of those Philistines because that's what Samson ended up killing. But there's 3,000 of God's people that gave in to him. And I tell you, we just need to quit giving in to the devil's crowd every time they turn around and shout. Well, the 3,000 said, well, we'll go and talk with him. They went to the top of the rock, uh, and they talked to Samson. Uh, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, he said, I'll let you uh, bind me up. They said, we're going to tie you, deliver you to them. Uh, he said, you can bind me up, tie me all you want to. Uh, uh, he said, just uh, don't you fall upon me yourself. That'd be like the preacher said, well, you can turn me over to the devil, but don't let the church get mad at me uh, and treat me bad uh, if I'm doing my best for God. Uh, and and they took him and they turned him over uh, to, to that crew of at least 1,000 Philistines. Uh, he was not one bit uh, overwhelmed uh, uh, by the number of them there. Uh, he wasn't caring uh, if there was one or 10,000. Uh, he was God's man uh, and he was going to do God's will as far as dealing with the Philistines in their life. Uh, and even though we're outnumbered it seems uh, in this day and time uh, when the Philistines come we want to recall the word of God that greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. If God is with us, who can be against us? We are in the minority, but thank God with God we're the majority. He said, no, I'm not a bit, I'm, I'm not going to give up to you. Whenever David was uh, finally put in the, the, on the throne, all the Philistines, it said, got together and came up against him. 
didn't intimidate David. David said, we'll go out and we'll do just what needs to be done to defeat the Philistines. And he did. You see, the mind is a battlefield. If the devil can get you to thinking you don't amount to nothing, then, then he can beat you up, kick you around like an old dirty cur dog, hey, amen, and say that, that you're nothing and God doesn't love you and care about you anymore. I'm telling you, folks, with the battlefield, Joyce Myers wrote a book on that. Uh, I'm not no Joyce Myers fan, I'll say that, but I do, I've known that before she ever wrote the book. Uh, if the devil can imprint those Philistine thoughts in the mind, uh, it won't be long that it'll have victory in your life. Uh, but if you'll fill your mind with the Word of God uh, and just rely back on that Word, uh, when the devil comes your way, then you'll be the one to come out victorious on the other side. Amen. They always try to come in overwhelming majorities. You know, I, I noticed years ago when I first started pastoring, you'd have a family in your church have a major problem once, twice a year. But, but that has accelerated. And now it's not just one family in your church. It's most champ families in your church have got a major problem in their life somewhere, whether it be sickness, finances, a family feud being played or whatever's going on, there's always something that's bothering people. And that's because these things have crept in. We, we've let down the Spirit of God is not as strong within the believer as it used to be. And the enemy is taking great advantage of that. He's saying, I've got you now, but I'm going to tell you, worst thing he can do with you now is kill you. And when he kills you, he'll just send you on to the very gate of heaven and you can walk in and say, howdy. I've been walking this way for a long time and I'm glad I finally made it. We have been given victory in our life over these things. Even though they have us far outnumbered. They bring great insinuations upon every individual and great intimidation. The devil's greatest tools is intimidation in our life and insinuation. I've got an old preacher that I talk to every once in a while and uh, since he ain't nowhere near here, and I hope he ain't hearing it, I, I get to where I don't want to talk to him much anymore. Because when you talk to him, it's always down. Down, down, down. It, it, I, I mean, this guy's uh, in, in his 80s, mid-80s. I preached a long time. Every time I talk to him, he'll get around to it. He'll say, you know, the devil has really been harassing me about things that I'd done years ago, things that I'd done. I said, brother, didn't you repent of them? Yes, I did. I said, well, he ain't got nothing on you. That's been repented of. But you know, the devil will come around and he'll put in your mind, well, you didn't raise those kids just right. That's why they got out there and they got in, in rebellion. That may be true in some instances, but in most instances, if you tried to raise them up to follow God and they're not following God, they just followed the flesh. That's all they done. Hey Amen. That, that's, no, that's no fault of the mom or dad, what they done, but the devil will use that insinuation. He'll just come with one thing after another. Oh, you know what you done back there before you got saved was so bad that God couldn't even forgive you. Hey, and there's no hope for you now within your life. You might as well just come to a place uh, that you give up and just quit on it. They come to intimidate. As I said, David wasn't intimidated, or Sam Samson wasn't intimidated with a thousand. And you know, the great thing uh, about this is when the, when the enemy comes uh, with this intimidation, my goodness, and he found that Samson could not be intimidated and would not be intimidated he found out that he had a fight on his hand because when they, they took, the elders of Israel took him down and presented him to the Philistines, the Philistines shouted. They shouldn't have shouted with a man that God had his spirit upon because whenever they shouted at him, Holy Ghost shouted back and he busted every fetter and everything that Samson was tied up with. 
You see, when you come to that place that, that you're living for God and walking with God, it's not you fighting all these battles. It's the Lord that's within you. It's not even really you that the, the enemy is coming after. He's coming to try to destroy the Lord of glory. That's what it's all about. He doesn't want a church to be here when the rapture doesn't take place. He never wanted Israel to be there when it come time for the Lord to come back and to take care of Israel and set up his kingdom. I, I tell you, he's tried to destroy from that time and we've just got to stand flat-footed and say, I'm not going to quit. I'm not giving up. Your intimidation won't work. We're not going to give over. We're going to walk right on and we're going to serve God. He'll intimidate and then he'll do, secondly, this to try to get you to quit. He'll take away every spiritual help. Now, if you were to go tonight to 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 19, it talks about when the Philistines came up in the early days of Saul as king of Israel. They came up, they took everything they wanted, and when they went back, they went to every blacksmith in the land of Israel that was a blacksmith, and they took them with them. You see, they, they, they left just a file for the people of Israel to sharpen their mattock. They came up, the Philistines are really lazy, you know what? They want to live off somebody else's production. Boy, you can say we got a lot of them. They want to live off of everybody else's production. When they would come up, they would wait until the crops were ready to harvest, and then they would come up and steal the crops. So whenever they came up and they took over the land of Israel, and they decided to leave. They said, now we can't just take the smiths with us and leave them nothing to sharpen their mattocks for because if we do that, they won't be able to hoe out the crops next year and we won't be able to come up and steal their crops then. So let's give them a file. They can sharpen their mattocks. They can raise their crops. But we'll take every smith with us. You know why? It was a smith that produced the weaponry. It was a smith that could make the sword, the spear, the shield to fight the Philistines with. So they're going to say, we're going to take away from the, the Israelitish people everything that, that will give them an ability to fight us. And when, when the Philistines, those pesky things, begin to work in our lives, they try to separate us first from the church. Well, you don't need to go to church now. I mean, you know it's dangerous. The COVID is out there, and it's real. I've lost friends to it. I'm not making fun of how dangerous the COVID is. And if it gets, would get bad in my church, I would shut it down for a while until it cleaned up. But at the same time, most of those folks that say, well, I can't go to church because of the COVID, they don't have any problem going to Walmart. Amen. Devil just takes a smith. Philistines take the smith. And then he'll say, you know, you're a little tired this morning, so you really don't have time to read the word of God. So just quit reading it. You're feeling a little over full of God's word anyway, aren't you? After all, last time you was church three months ago, you heard a message. <laughs> hey man, you're still eating on that. So, so I don't really need to read the Bible. And then it comes prayer time and the devil says, you know, your knees are hurting. Boy, mine have hurt the last 10 months. He says, your knees are hurting. You don't want to pray. And, and most folks say, well, I don't get on my knees to pray anyway. Well, don't even sit in your seat and pray. Take a day off. And the day off ends up in a week and a month and a year. And you're not seeking the face of God. What's happening? The ability of the smith. It's taken away from you. That that will produce in you strength and, and power to be able to walk with God and to be able to fight the enemy in your life. You've been robbed of it. I worked with a black boy several years ago. He, he worked uh, uh, one summer out there the county while I was working. Boy, me and him had a good time talking about the Lord. He'd, he'd gotten saved. He was hungry. I said, you know, one of these days you're going to be one of them wordsmiths for God, brother. If you keep up, you're going to be one of them that's teaching people the word of God so they'll know how to fight the fight. Uh, but I said, don't you dare let the devil take you captive uh, and get you back down in the land of the Philistines. 
Because we need all the help we can get in this time. We need to, the prayers of one another, the love of one another, and the unity of one another. And we need the word of God that assures us we're going to win. Every once in a while when I get uh, looking around and see the things look bad, I'll just take the Bible and turn to the last chapter of the book of Revelation. And I don't see nothing back there but victory and a great time in the Lord. Amen. That's the way it's going to end up for the people that serve God and walk with Him. You just make sure you don't let the smiths come or be taken away from you where you can't fight. How do you battle the Philistines? Number one, never shout or speak your fear to the devil. Now if all you do is go around wringing your hands and talking to yourself and everybody you come in contact with and say, I just don't believe I can make it, you probably not. Not only does God hear what you say, but the devil hears what you say yeah. Amen. through his demonic spirit. God said that we have been given whom, when we get saved, all these little ones have their angels constantly behold the face of the Father. Well, I'm still a little one. I've got at least two of them. That was plural. And I've kept them busy for the last 39 years. And I believe when you get saved, the devil assigns to, to, to you a demon that will follow you around and do everything that he possibly can to trip you up. And he hears everything negative you got to say. Some people, like I said a while ago, are so negative, you can be right up to the, uh, almost floating in heaven by the time they get down. Brother, you need to get to a mental hospital. They can't talk about having any victory. They can't talk about anything good that's going to happen. They, all they do is show their fear. I like John Wayne. Now, you, you people, older people, sad thing, the young people don't even know who John Wayne is. <laughs> but I like John Wayne. And one of them shows where, where his little grandson and big kidnapped, and he had to go get him back, and him and that grandson are hiding behind that. That, that big stack of, a stack of straw, and they was acting like they was going to turn the buckshot out of that shotgun away. And, and he asked his grandson, and said, how are you? He said, I'm scared. And John Wayne said, I am too, but we don't want to let them know that. <laughs> Amen. You're in a fight, you don't want to let the devil know how scared you are. Anybody remember old R.W. Shambach? Ever hear him, old Pentecostal preacher, he's been dead. I, I suppose he's dead. If he ain't, he'd be a hundred. But boy, I, I've got uh, 12 of his messages, 12 of his best sermons. And one of those he tells about when he was in high school, he was up to his junior or senior year. He said, I was six foot tall, six one or so, and said, weighed 190 and nothing but muscle. Uh, but he said, there was a big guy in school that constantly tormented me. He said that for three years, that big guy followed me around. He'd knock the books out of my hand. Said he wore out four sets of books just from having knocked out of his hand, not studying. And he said, I was afraid to say anything to him because he was about six foot five, weighed 230. He said, but one day, and the men knows, are going to know what I'm going to talk about. You know why it takes boys when they get 15, 16, 17 years old longer in the bathroom? Uh, you start laughing now, guys. If you got a mirror in there, they're in there. They say, I got four whiskers now. <laughs> I'm getting to be a man. Next month, got five. I never got beyond five. <laughs> and then now, remember Charles Atlas, the bodybuilder? Then they'll have their shirt off and they'll get in front of that mirror. Charles Atlas, eat your heart out. <laughs> Shambach said he was doing that one day in that bathroom, looking at that build on him. He said a voice inside of him said, you ain't going to let that bully bully you around no more, are you? He said, yeah, I ain't going to let him bully me no more. He said, I was all pumped up, went to school the next day, started up that hall, seen that bully coming down the other way. Said, I went clear to the other side of the, the hall. Turned my head away from him and the bully went past. I saw him out of the corner of my eye. And I thought, boy, everything's all right. Said, I lost that pump that I had the night before. 
said all of a sudden, Colonel Wham, he'd slipped up behind me, hit me up alongside the head, about knocked me down, went his way down the hall laughing at me and said, I jumped up and said, hey! He said, I really didn't mean to say that. I was going to be quiet. He <laughs> said, that old boy turned around and looked at me. He said, well, you've got something to say to me? He said, I looked at him and said, said, that's exactly what I said. Afraid to say a word. Said, all the time, that little fellow inside of me, saying about, what about last night? He said, shut up in there. <laughs> he said, I finally worked up the nerve. I said, you've slapped me up alongside the head for the last time. And said, that boy looked at me with a big grin on his face. He said, I've been wanting you to say that for three years. And said, here he come, charging at me. He said, well, no time to retreat, to change your mind. He said, I just dug into the floor and said there was two blows flow, hit. Said, I hit him right square in the chin and he hit the floor. Said, I didn't know he had a glass chin. I knocked him out. He said, I'm a jumping around. Said, hey, Bob, look, 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 I knocked out the bully. John, look, he, he's out, he's out. I got him. And he said, then I got mad. Because I'd put up with him for three years. I beaten up on men, intimidating me. When all the time he had a glass jaw and I could have knocked him out any time. I tell you folks, the devil got a glass jaw. Jesus hit him right square on it when he come off that cross. Thank God. He hit him and knocked him for a loop. Jesus already gave us the victory. We're just here to enforce it. We've just got to go on. Praise the Lord. He comes to intimidate just like every bully in the world does in his life. Uh, and we just need to get past that, not speak our fear to him, uh, but walk on knowing uh, that Christ has given you and I the victory in our life. Amen. And then secondly tonight, make sure your consecration is intact. You see, to have a vow of a Nazarite upon your life was a, a vow of consecration to God. You didn't drink wine, you didn't eat grapes, you didn't cut your hair especially. And Samson had that vow of consecration still upon his life. His hair's never been cut until he finally opened his mouth when his head rasped in Delilah's lap. And she brought the barber in that night and they gave him the first flat top. And when he woke up, she said, the Philistines be upon thee, and there was nothing he could do. But as long as that hair was there, that was his consecration. But it wasn't just his hair. When he came down off the mountain and was handed over to 1,000 of the Philistines, it says that he picked up a brand new jawbone of a donkey. And if you go back and you look that up, that was a consecrated animal consecrated to God. Exodus 34, 20 said, give all the animals that you could buy back. But a donkey, you couldn't buy it back. You just broke its neck in consecration to God. And he just picked up a jawbone of a little donkey had just been born, wasn't going to be bought back. They broke its neck. Its jawbone was laying there and he picked that up. And with that consecration and the consecration on his life, he slew a thousand Philistines. The devil cannot overtake what is consecrated to God. That's why it's important for people when they get saved, not to be content to dwell where they got saved, but to go deeper and deeper and consecrate that life totally to the hands of the Lord. In the book of Daniel, Belshazzar's great fast or feast that he was having, God was going to let him by with the, the drunkenness. God was going to let him by with the mockery. God was going to let him by with every sin taking place at that. But when he sent and he said, you go over there in the storehouse, there are vessels there that were brought back from the temple in Jerusalem when, when my grandfather took that city. 
you bring those vessels. We're going to drink out of vessels of silver and gold that they used to worship their God. Those vessels had been consecrated hundreds of years before. But when they poured the wine in it and began to drink out of it, all of a sudden a, a man's finger was seen writing on the wall. And the interpretation, you've been found uh, weighed in the balance and found wanting. He touched what was consecrated to God. And whenever we're in a battle, it's important, make sure everything's under the blood. Make sure that that life is totally committed to Jesus, whether you sink, whether you swim, no matter what takes place. And when you do that within your life, you'll come out on the other side with victory. I, I don't know why. Now, I preached this message a uh, week before last to my church, the little church I'm pastoring. But when I felt like that I was supposed to preach it here tonight, I felt like there were some people in here that have had Philistines all over them. Four times in one chapter, Delilah's hollering out, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And I really believe with all of my heart that I've preached tonight to some folks that have been going through it of late. The, the, the devil has bombarded the mind. There's been physical problems, monetary problems, all types of problems that have come your way, and you've got to a place that you just don't know if you can make it. And I really believe if you'll let God tonight, you can hit an altar, and people can pray for you, and you can leave here. The situation at home may not have changed, but you have changed. God doesn't want anybody backsliding. God doesn't want anybody quitting. But the enemy of the mind is a Philistine that wants to constantly come and destroy our relationship with the Lord. Amen. If we could have an invitation tonight, a song of invitation. I tell you, if we'll just, if, if we'll just let God, folks, we're living in a day we're going to have to let God. I'm sure that folks here, I'm 69 years old. Folks here a lot older than me, some of you. But you'd have to agree this is the craziest time you've ever seen in our nation. The Philistines are running loose. I mean, whoever thought you had to wait till you got 16 or 18 to figure out if you was a boy or a girl. You know, that old dumb doctor the day I was born, he probably... Uh, looked at me and said, Howard, you got a son. Well, he was wrong. He's supposed to wait till I was 16. Let me figure out what it was. <laughs> How stupid. You wait. If it goes on a little bit, somebody's going to drag your mule into court and say, I want to marry my mule. <laughs> or their dog and say, I want to marry my dog and I want my dog to have my benefits. Get my Social Security, my Medicare. I love my dog. Why not? We've already went over the deadline. And God's people are going to have to hold fast and stand firm to have the victory God wants us to have. Would you stand with us tonight if you'd like to pray? I, I tell you honestly, I'd really like to pray with some folks tonight and see some folks get some victory and help. Won't you come? Mind the Lord this evening. One plea, but that blood of for me. Oh, Jesus, bids me come to the Lamb of God I come I come oh Jesus tonight think not to be my soul 
tell you just a little story real quickly uh, it's been about a year and a half or maybe a little more than that ago I was in a service quite a few people there and there was a young lady that Sunday morning was up at the altar and she prayed with a few others that had came and she was going through the praise of the Lord routine herself and and all of this and I really felt God impressing me that I needed to pray with her we ran out of time. I don't push when I feel something. I, I, I got to know. We came back the night, that night for the service, and it was almost a, a duplicate of what was going on that morning. And this, this young lady was up, and she's a good kid, a good young lady. She was up going through the motions of praise and God, hands in the air. And I finally got the nerve up, and I went up, and I said, would you care if I prayed with you? And she said, I sure wish you would. And we got on the altar in about probably a minute of praying. She was a shouting victory. She'd been going through the motion, and her mom and dad said for several months, that's all she'd been doing, just going through the motion. We can learn how to do it. We can learn what to say. We can learn how to throw our hands up. And she said later, you know, I, I told the devil everything you told him, Danny. But when I told him, he didn't leave. But when you told him, he did. <laughs> that old Phil them Philistines, they're no respect of persons. They'll just grab hold of you and they won't let go until somebody makes them let go and Jesus can do that if there's problems in your life you need help with tonight Jesus can help you she's went on just done great the last year and a half or so since that time great things have happened in her life but if she hadn't got free that night it's hard to tell if she would have ever even been able to walk on with God for the rest of this time if you're here tonight I'm going to just say one more time I felt like there were people here that needed to pray and be prayed with if you're here tonight and you need prayer you need to come I believe God will help you you've still got time you've still got 10 more minutes before out of church time anybody this evening just want to slip out and say I, I need some prayer tonight I need help. Just wait a moment. Amen. We ain't going to give the devil any, any opportunity to be praised. Come on, Roger. We appreciate God coming tonight and being able to be here with you. Look for great things this week. Praise the Lord. Amen. I heard a, and I've probably said it here more than one time, uh, a fellow used to be my Sunday school teacher years ago told him about a, a, the evangelist that come to the Jackson Avenue church up there, and uh, said he'd come in and he kind of slithered up over top of the, the pulpit, and he says, go home and pray, and come back tomorrow night and see what the Holy Ghost can do. And I, I thought a lot about that. Uh, we don't know what God can do. We're, we're living in, in a day when, when a lot of people think that God is dead. But if that little nucleus of people, and we've got a nucleus of people that still believe in the great and the mighty things of God. Amen. There's not a one of us that are, are here tonight that don't have loved ones that are outside the ark of safety. And we'll go home and pray. And come back in faith believing tomorrow night great and mighty things can occur. This can be a revival like we've not seen. One of those Amen. that we used to hear about. Yeah. 
God's people pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for all that you've done for us. We, we're, it's been good, thank God, to be in God's house and to hear the preaching of the living Word of God. And we pray that as we go from this place, that you would go with us. And Heavenly Father, bring us back again tomorrow night ready to do business for you. And for all things you do, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, and amen. 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 amen.